Hello and welcome to Business is Seven. My name is Jo Marie Daddy and I'm joined by financial colleague, Mr. Philippe Sisiku. Thank you very much for joining us again. Thank you, Jo. Good to be here. Great to be here indeed. As always, a jam-packed program with some specific focus on food prices in Namibia. Philippus, you uh, did quite a bit of research on that. Yes, indeed. Um, and it's, yeah, uh, food prices are shooting up and, yeah, I mean, everyone depends, need food. Absolutely. <laughs> we'll uh, tell you all about that as soon as we're back. Connection. It's in the human touch, the feeling of belonging. It inspires us and empowers us, creates clarity from complexity. It starts new conversations, unlocks the power of advice, and makes an impact on your life. At Alex Forbes, we pioneer insight to provide you with advice that connects your decisions of today to your impact tomorrow. On the front page of Business 7 today, the printed version, which you can find in Republic Kane, Namibian Sun and Algemeine Zeitung, as well as on um, our websites and our LinkedIn account. Philippus, you did a story about food prices. Um, the heading of it is food prices boiling <laughs> over. Are they indeed? Yes, they are boiling over. Um, then, you know, everyone needs food. Um, food is very important. And when food becomes unaffordable or unavailable, uh, it becomes problematic. So yeah, the Namibia Statistic Agency recently released the inflation statistics, and it indicated that overall inflation um, uh, came out at 7.2% uh, in uh, February uh, from 7% uh, from in January. And it was mainly driven by the food food and non-alcoholic beverage, uh, beverages uh, category, as well as transport. And looking specifically on the food uh, uh, price uh, inflation figures, overall food inf inflation uh, came in at 14.5% in scary. February. And that's from about 5.5% uh, in February last year. That is truly <laughs> a scary figure. Yeah, and if you look at the at the food and non-alcoholic non -alcoholic beverages um, weight in the Namibian uh, Consumer yes. Index. It carries the second largest mm. weight. So it means whatever we earn, we are likely to spend it on food. Precisely. And, and if food pr uh, prices are, are shooting up, it's, it's, it sort of uh, affects consumers' affordability. So yeah, um, so it's a matter of are we going to cut on our, on our consumption levels? Are we going to cut uh, down on our other consumption so that we can just make sure that we uh, consume the same quantity of goods? Precisely. Or are we going to try and make some extra money? Um, <laughs> one, one of the um, even more scary figures in, in the NSA data, Philippus, I saw overall food inflation at 14, but breads and cereals, which is staple, at 22%. I mean, it is just, <laughs> you know, it, it, this is a basic human right that we are talking about. Um, what is one of the big problems around food inflation is the fact that we don't produce enough for ourselves and we, Im we import. We're basically victims of, of whatever happens outside. Yeah. So I think we are v vulnerable to, um, to external shocks because... We import, on an annual basis, on average, we import about 80% um, of, of our food requirements. And that means only the mm. tiny 20% is what we get from the local market. And the 20% will also be affected by the low rainfall that we are, the, or in the inconsistent rainfall, and also the um, imminent drought. And also, uh, considering that we, are, we highly depend on, on, on imports, um, according to the trade states, um, South Africa, we import most of our goods from South Africa. Yes. And um, I was just uh, checking at the statistics, South Africa recorded its first trade deficit in three years, in the fourth quarter of 2022. Unbelievable. Hey? And obviously, um, a deficit can only occur when you are either exporting less mm. or you are exporting more. 
And just a few weeks back here, we were talking about how load shedding can um, impact the production mm. of, um, of goods and services. So, yeah, you can see now that uh, the impact of load shedding that South Africa is not producing enough goods and it's obviously affecting exports. So what does that mean? It could lead to a shortage. It could, and you know what shortages lead to? Drives up prices. Yeah. It, it's unbelievable. Um, uh, more and more statistics becoming available around the impact of load shedding. And because it's a re result season, mm -hmm. we see that in um, some of the listed companies in South Africa coming out, it's literally costing some of these companies millions and millions of rand a day that they lose according or um, due to load, load shedding. Yeah. But um, the ripple effect, of course, um, is spilling over in protest, etc. Yes, and just uh, on, on Monday, the protest started in, in, in South Africa. And I was uh, looking at a video where Julius Malema is saying he does not want to see a truck moving. And obviously, goods that are uh, transported from South Africa are usually trans uh, uh, transported uh, with trucks. And so that, that sort of already will cause another mm. disruption. And also, just before the protest, the, um, the high, high logistic cost and f increasing fuel prices were also just expected uh, to, to, to increase uh, goods and services. And also, uh, the other thing is that uh, there are a lot of uh, South African franchise businesses in Namibia. So whatever exactly. is happening in South Africa, we can expect uh, that to impact us as well. We've also recently seen a report around food security in the country. How does that look? Yeah, so it looks really bad. Um, it indicated that the people that are most vulnerable to uh, food security crisis are the ones in mo more in the northern mm. regions uh, that's in zone two now, according to our zonal. Um, yeah, so th those are our, our northern regions, and uh, yeah, and and if you look at the northern regions, those are the ones that are, uh, are mostly dependent on subsistence uh, farming, for example, for food. And now with the imminent drought, with the low rainfall, ish. Indeed, ish. It's going to be a tough year um, oh, waiting for us by uh, the looks of it. Um, what do the experts say? What, what, what can we sort of expect? Yeah, um, they expect, um, they expect um, um, inflation to remain elevated uh, due to these whole uh, supply constraints and so on. And yeah, um, it's just putting pressure on consumers because interest rates also uh, remains um, uh, elevated. Um, and uh, I was also looking at the South Africa's uh, inflation expectations. Yes. Uh, analysts uh, of the view, in uh, in inflation expectations are high. So that's, so that's sort of already giving the South African mm -hmm. Reserve Bank room to, to increase exactly. to because they are in, in inflation targeting central yes. bank. And because of our um, one uh, of our, our peg, peg yeah. with South Africa, we might just follow suit. We'll have to <laughs> follow suit. And I think we'll stop. Uh, we're trying to bring you some good news here too. We're not doing a great job of it tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much to FMB for this opportunity. much to FNB, what an experience. I never got to do shopping in five minutes, but look at all this. Staying on the Namibian front, uh, Philip is also a stat that you very keenly uh, monitor, new vehicle uh, sales in Namibia. 
Slightly better news there. <laughs> we spoke to Angelique Bock, a research associate at Simona Storm, about the situation um, last week. Making her debut in uh, the Best 7 studio is Angeline Bock. She's a research assistant at Simone Storm. Welcome and thank you for joining us, Angelique. Thank you, Joe Marie. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Well, you economists are very um, fond of talking about uh, green shoots in the economy. But I think for the purpose of this conversation, maybe we should be talking about reefing up some engines because it's all about <laughs> vehicle sales. And um, February's situation looks a lot better. Can you summarize for us in a nutshell what happened in February with new vehicle sales in Maria? So in February, we definitely saw an increase. Um, vehicle sales equal to 1,103 units that were sold in February. Um, this is a 24.9% 24 increase from the previous February of 2022, which is great news for us. And uh, compared to January, we see that this is a 36.3% increase. For January, we only sold 798 vehicles compared to 1,000. 103 and uh, we saw that 51% of these of these vehicles sold were passenger vehicles and 44% were light commercial vehicles and uh, further to further that stat um, we saw that 46% of these vehicles were Toyotas and then um, 160 were VWs in units and then 53 were Kias. Great and um You've mentioned a lot of stats now. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how that compares to what we've seen in the past? So in the past, the vehicle sales have been sluggish um, for the economic term, which means that it, it has not been increasing as, as much as we would like to see it. But I think it is starting to reach pre-pandemic levels compared to the past, whereas this has been the highest since I think 2019, 2018. 2018, exact, right, yeah. yes. 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 So certainly um, a lot of improvement there, even though it's still considerably below the peak of what we've seen. In your view, what has driven this latest performance, this good performance? Um, I recently had a, had a conversation with um, stakeholders that work at rental companies, and they said that they have been buying lots of cars to uh, make up for the peak season coming up. So that's also to avoid the, the supply chain issues that they've been seeing. So they want to be ready for the tourism peak season. And um, when I went to look at the data per se, I saw that many of the Toyotas that were, so, that were sold were mostly off-road um, cars which coincides with, with what the stakeholder has said. The fact that rental companies um, are looking at getting in more vehicles um, uh, ahead of time, that's also an indication of um, some confidence in the recovery of the tourism sector. Yes, definitely, definitely. So we are we are hoping to see this reflect in our uh, um, hospitality stats report as well. And um, you also touched on supply chain issues. Can you elaborate slightly on that? So we know that ever since the war in Ukraine and between Russia and U Ukraine, there has been some issues with the semiconductor. In our previous report, we have spoken about, or previous reports, because it's actually been an ongoing issue. Um, Ukraine supply, supplies neon almost 50% of neon to the world. And um, ever since the war, they have stopped this. So, and the neon is used to produce the chips. So uh, that has been causing lots of supply chain issues. And also since China um, had the strict COVID policies, uh, it was very difficult for trade to happen. So there were lots of issues in terms of supply. In terms of the rest of the year, what do you think the outlook looks like? So we did see that the that our government predicted that they will spend 210 million, I mean, yes, 210 million on, on vehicles for the upcoming fiscal year. So 
if that does materialize, then we do see that uh, vehicle sales will definitely go up. Um, we do we do see that other rental companies will then also further this uh, a notion of buying off-road vehicles to facilitate incoming um, or forecasted incoming um, tourism. You made an interesting um, observation in your report about uh, individuals buying cars and uh, that there's still some reluctance um, from the bank side because it might be a risky transaction and that people are now actually buying vehicles cash. Yes, yes. Um, this can be substantiated by the fact that life, life insurance claims between 2020 quarter one and 2022 quarter one has equated to 19 billion. So we do do we do assume that there is money in 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 the economy that's floating around that's that certainly... people are using to buy uh, vehicles. <laughs> very, very interesting observation from your side. As a final question, you also touched in your report on the issue of um, electric vehicles. Um, what is your take on that? So locally, um, we do see growth, but very slow growth of e electric vehicles. I think globally, it's definitely more apparent because um, they have the facilities for it. For it. Whereas uh, we are currently, Namibians are scared that we might also be facing load shedding. So <laughs> putting that together with electric vehicles would be a bit of a scare for them as well. So yeah, we do see that electric vehicles will grow, but very, very slowly in our country. Angelique, it was very nice having you on the program. It will certainly not be the last time. Uh, thank you for your <laughs> insights and have a great day. Thank you so much, Jo Marie. Also repeat from last week, Philip, but nevertheless, a very important one, one that once again stresses the importance of employee well-being in um, a company culture and how that is actually built into uh, the risk strategy of certain companies. And we had Capricorn Group's risk um, business officer, Horst Simon, in the studio to talk about that. We all know that employee well-being is very, very important for a company. But did you know that it's actually a crucial part of a company's risk management uh, strategy? Now, we have an expert in the studio here. Thank you very much for joining us, Horst Simon. He's uh, the business risk officer at the Capricorn Group. Welcome to our studio. Thank you very much, Jamari. It's nice to be here and thank you for the opportunity to chat about this. Well, of course, you can read Horst's entire article in uh, the printed version of Biz 7 uh, today in uh, the daily newspaper, Schreibulikain, Allgemeine Zeitung, and the Mibian Sun, and you can also read it on our website or on uh, LinkedIn. But uh, let's get back to a conversation about this. Now, in this article, it starts off um, rather intimidating because you talk about affecting effective neuroscience and social neuroscience. What are those? I think we, we, do, we do have the formal academic mm. definitions for those in the article, but I'm not uh, a neuroscientist, I'm a risk <laughs> practitioner. But I think the important part of that is that how do these things affect people's decisions and the perception of risk? Because the management of risk is all about the, per the person's response to a situation yes. of risk, and that's influenced by a whole lot of things. And if we look at different influences over the years, you know, we focused on a lot of the things like culture, like um, background, like um, generations even, but we didn't look at the emotions. And with COVID-19 and the highlight around uh, well-being of our employees, this is also a key element that we need to look at when it comes to the perception of risk and the response to risk. So that links back to the neuroscience where we look at how your emotions and uh, play, play into your decision you take on, 
on the management of risk because people think a lot about it's it's the historic data that we convert into all these reports but when the time come how you respond that is what is the key element to the effective management of risk and i was delighted to see that uh, an influential group like capricorn um, released this thought le leadership piece by you because um, since COVID-19 it's been an ongoing debate globally the effect yeah. of the pandemic and um, the consequences and trauma thereof on yeah. um, employees well-being and how that in the end will impact on, on corporates. Um, a, a healthy employee. I'm not talking about me, so you can't, <laughs> you can't cite me. But what does a healthy, a mentally healthy employee look like? Yeah, I think just maybe to take a quick step back, yes. Capricorn Group started with the Risk Culture Builder Program in 2019 when I came back to Namibia specifically to look at risk culture. And then, as you mentioned, with COVID, there's more focus on it. I think for the healthy employee, the, the key element, we highlight a few things in the article, mm. but the key one to me is that self-motivation. It's that ownership. I own how I respond to a situation of risk. I own my perception of that. Uh, and I need to be aware of, for example, biases that play into this. And I need to be aware of my emotions. When I get up this morning, um, and I'm not in a good mood, I may take the wrong decision uh, with regards to the management of risk in my job. So I need to be aware of those things. So for me, the key element there is that ownership and that self-motivation. Um, there are a few others that we mentioned, but to me, that's the most important thing, that the employee owns it. Um, don't wait for your manager to come and tell you, uh, you know, this is the way you should do it. Uh, own it, know what the shortcomings are, know what your emotions are, and then uh, know that that affects how you respond to that situation of risk. And that doesn't just pertain to the workplace. As we've seen globally, um, it, it is an ongoing movement that of self-awareness yeah. and mindfulness, as they, as they call it, uh, that you should be totally in touch with your emotions so that you can manage them yeah. and detach them sort of from your actions because they can influence uh, your yeah. actions quite drastically. Yeah, they definitely influence your actions and in our focus, how you respond to a situation of risk. Uh, I often, in the, in the training sessions, I often use the, the example of, of the married men and the, and the single men in the room and I ask them if you have a fight with your wife or your girlfriend, do you just quietly close the door, pull away and drive within the speed limit? And normally the woman will burst out <laughs> laughing while the men still think on how to answer this question. So yes. And here we have your, the same scenario. I'm your laughing. emotions plays a role. <laughs> it does indeed and it has consequences. Yeah. We've looked at the, the employee side of things, but what is the role that leaders in corporations and companies can play to promote this well-being? Yeah, I think, again, I, I, I mentioned a few in the article, but the key one that stand out is that open conversation, creating that environment where people feel safe. You'll see, and you've probably read a lot about the uh, psychological safety aspects and all those things we talk about nowadays, but that to me is the, is, is the important thing. Leaders need to be open to these conversations. Uh, linking it back to the management of risk and risk culture, the conversations are more important than the reports. Because the reports are normally as at the end of last month or last quarter, but the conversations are what drives the responses. Exactly. And that is, a, that is an important thing, creating that environment where we not go on a witch hunt if you raise something negative. We're gonna look at what are the lessons that we learn and how do we take it forward to have effective management of risk in our business. But to have, to feel safe and to have that confidence, there should also be a big element of trust. Yes, definitely. That is, um, you know, it can never exist without that element of trust. And again, there's a lot of research lately around mm. the element of trust um, and also how that got highlighted through the pandemic that we've just Precisely. gone through. Um, that, that people didn't feel that they can disclose that I have COVID. 
uh, and then yes, there's also yes, all of a sudden this stigma, stigma. and thing that, that, that come out of it where we really need to work on how we treat our employees and how we create that well-being for our employees in that open conversation platforms uh, in, in all aspects. Oh, uh, it's not just uh, from the top, it is horizontal mm -hmm. as well and it is from the bottom up as well. Uh, people need to feel free to have those open and frank conversations about risk. Uh, and as we mentioned, be aware of how their emotions influence those conversations and those perceptions. Very much so. And um, as a final question, a roundup comment, um, could you elaborate on how important it is to have positivity in the workplace? It is it's very important. I think you wouldn't have asked the question if it wasn't, but um, the whole world is negative around us. A lot of what we read, a lot of what we hear, a lot of what we see, and we tend to, to, to focus on those negative things and how that affect the way I'm working or the, the way my company is operating. Um, we need to look at that. Risk is always risk and opportunity. In every situation of risk, there's also a situation of opportunity. So we need to move this backward thinking of risk management that is all about reports and colors and those kind of things to a more positive forward thinking. Where are the opportunities? Where can we take more risk for more reward without compromising the quality of what we're doing and the profitability of our business? It has been delightful. Uh, talking to you. Please read the article. It is extremely insightful. Thank you very much for driving, you and Capricorn, <laughs> for driving um, this agenda too, because it's incredibly important, not only in Namibia's economy, but globally. Host Simon, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Germany. I enjoyed being here. Thank you. Every day, you make choices that make you legendary. Journey together with us on the path to securing your legacy as a member of the League of Legends. With the Select Platinum Bundle Fee Premium Bank offering, you will access tools that will enable you to thrive. If you earn 850,000 Namibian dollars per annum or more, you can apply for this offering today via bankvento.com.na for only 447 Namibian dollars per month. Bank Vento, a member of Capricorn Group. And that was the end and of that, the show. And that's <laughs> the end of the show. That's what we had for you uh, this week. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed your little bit of a downtime mm -hmm. uh, with Independence Day. I think a lot of people actually made a little bit of a long weekend uh, from it. So enjoy it. We'll be back same time, same place next week. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.